Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. Today we will start chapter 4 of Calculus and Vectors and this chapter focuses on the derivatives of sinusoidal functions. So chapter 4.1 will deal with instantaneous rate of change of sinusoidal functions. And as we've already done this, you know, this is essentially the preliminary step towards find the derivative of these functions. So first we're going to go through some quick review and then we're going to talk about the main concepts we need to know for this chapter. So here's the quick review. Sinusoidal functions are those functions whose graphs have this shape of a sine wave, right? So it just goes up and then down. It's just a nice little wave. A secant line is a line that is passing through two different points on a curve. So you should remember this. We've done this many times before. And a tangent line is a line that touches but doesn't cross a curve at only one point. So it will touch the graph and then never cross it anywhere else. In trigonometry, we actually have the term secant and tangent as a little bit differently. You could interpret them differently. So a secant or the secant of theta, as we know, is hypotenuse over the adjacent side. And then a tangent, or the tangent of theta, is equals to the opposite side over the adjacent side. So knowing these terms is quite important because when we're talking about the same names, so if we're talking about a secant, you need to know which ones we're dealing with. Since secant theta and tan theta are both periodic functions, we could also conclude that the rate of change of these sinusoidal functions will also be periodic in nature. So the reason for that is, again, since we've just discussed that we're talking about hypotenuse over adjacent, right? No matter where you go over your sine graph, you will always be repeating your hypotenuse in your adjacent side because that's what it is. It's just never ending repetition of a certain uh, segment of the graph. So if we know that the secant, which would be the uh, average rate of change, is uh, periodic, and the tangent, which would be the instantaneous rate of change, is periodic, then we could conclude that all the rate of changes of sinusoidal functions will be periodic in nature. Another important concept for you to understand is that the derivative of a sinusoidal function will also be always another sinusoidal function. So this right now is a little bit hard to prove, but we will prove it in the next chapter. However, for now, you just need to know that it's a sinusoidal function as well. So now that we have this little quick review, let's talk about our new concepts. So first, to do this, I took a question out of the textbook. So here we're given the graph of the function y is equals to negative sine x. We need to identify all the points where the slope is zero, a local maximum, and a local minimum. We also need to find the intervals in which the curve is concave down and concave up. So let's do the slope of zero first. So, uh, as we've done before in every single unit, the understanding what a local maximum or a local minimum or a slope of zero means is universally the same. For a function, for it to have a local maximum or a local minimum, it must have a slope of zero, right? Because if we have a slope of zero, that is where we were going from either increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing either way it should be zero so on our graph let's find where the slope is indeed zero well the slope would be zero at our points at the local maximum local minimums of this graph right so here we'd have a slope of zero here would have a slope of zero and so on and so forth so this on our derivative function would be the zeros, right? That is where the slope is zero. So we found the answer to the first question. Finding where the slope is a local maximum 
is a little bit more tricky. However, we just need to remember what that means. For it to be a local maximum, that means we have the steepest slope we could possibly have and it is positive. So looking at this, if we just draw uh, little lines that are crossing it at one point, so this would be straight, and then it would slowly start curving down, right? It would start curving down until it's facing this way. The, we need to note that we were going down, so it is negative, and now it's standing straight up, which means it's the steepest it could be. So this right here would actually be a local minimum. Using the same steps, we would find that this right here is a local maximum. Since we know that these are also periodic, we could determine that the next step, where it would be a local maximum, would be over here. And then over here, over here, over here, and over here. To define this as a function, or as an, uh, how do I say it? To define these points, right, we could write a simple descriptions of how these points could be found. So again, if we just want to look at them, it's pi over here, this is 3 pi, this is 5 pi, this is negative 3 pi, negative pi, and negative 5 pi. What all of these have in common is that they are odd multiples of pi, right? Uh, here we have a negative, here's positive, so how do we describe something as odd? Well, we just take 2 times pi plus 1. Right? However, here, since we have an ever repeating amount of points, we need to add the constant k in here for it to work. So now we have pi plus 2k times pi. So again, to, for it to be odd, we need to multiply pi by 2. So now we have an even number. And then for it to be odd, we add one more pi for it to be odd. Similarly, for it to be negative, and a local minimum, we'd have to look at the, all the remaining points, right? So the remaining points would be this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. All of these are just even uh, multiples of pi. So here it's quite simple. We could describe all the points as x is equal to 2k pi. Now we need to talk about where it's concave up and concave down. This in itself is super simple. Remember, a concave up looks like a smiley face, a concave down looks like a frowny face. So in our case, a concave down would be the frowny faces. So this is one, two, three, four, five. And then we have a little bit of the remaining ones. We could describe this as the regions where it's concave down. So we could for example, list out that between negative 3 pi, so between here and 2 pi, or sorry, this should be a negative 2 pi, we have a concave down. Similarly, from this point to this point, so from negative pi to 0, we have concave down and so on and so forth. It follows the same pattern. For it to be concave up, it's smiling, so we have the first one is negative 6 to negative 5, from negative 4 to negative 3. From negative 2 pi to negative pi, I didn't say pi just because it's too much to say, by the way, uh, and so on and so forth. Again, you could list out probably three. That's usually what I would recommend for a test if this is what they're asking for. But just as a general concept, I wrote down two so they could all fit on the page. So if you understand that, we need to continue with our questions. So here we have another uh, question and it's asking us, let's find out what the maximum and minimum values of the slopes were. So we already found where the points were the steepest, right? It was at these places where it reached the X axis. However, what mattered was whether it was going down or whether it was going up. So if we were going down, that means it's a negative. And if it's a straight line, it's a one. So this is a negative one, this is a one. Negative one, one, and so on and so forth, which is what we found here. Then we also were asked to sketch a graph of the instantaneous rate of change. 
and the way we would do this is a little bit more complicated. However, what I would do is again, remember that this was a straight line and this was down. So now, uh, since this is down and this is a straight line, here we have a zero and here we have a negative one. How do we draw something from zero to negative one? Well, it would look something like this, right? From zero to negative one. So now instead of it being like this, it should be going like this. Then it should go up because that's how sinusoidal functions work. So now we have this and then up and then down again, continuing so on and so forth. The more you do this, the more you'll realize it'll look like a graph we already studied. Again, that would be the uh, cosine graph, which is what we're going to discuss next chapter. Lastly, it's asking us to quickly check if y equals negative sine of x has a point of inflection or multiple points of inflection. So as you can see here, we were going from concave up to concave down, which would immediately mean we have an inflection point because we do reach the point of zero, right? Where our line is the steepest. So now, we, since we have that, we do know there are points of inflection. Using this reasoning, we could prove that all sinusoidal functions have points of inflections, even like tangent, because remember it goes like this. So this is going from concave down to concave up. So there's a point of inflection right there. So there is actually no homework for today because the rest of the questions in the textbook require you to use a graphing calculator or something of the same nature. So unless you have that, I really wouldn't recommend doing the questions. We're going to start with chapter 4.2 tomorrow, so hopefully I'll see you all there. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye-bye!